Hello everyone! Thank you so much for joining us for today's career panel. Our focus this week and last week is to highlight all the diverse career opportunities that are available in the medical field, whether it's research or uh, in the hospital setting. So first of uh, all, I want to thank all of our panelists for joining us today and I would like to begin by introducing Dr. Andrew Gao, Dr. Mei Kwong, Dr. Lori Joseph, and Dr. Grace Gao. Uh, so I'm going to begin with Dr. Andrew Gao. Can you please begin by introducing yourself and your job title? Uh, so my name is uh, Andrew Gao. Uh, I'm a professor of pharmacology and toxicology at the Ernest Mario School of Pharmacy, which is part of Rutgers University. Um, and I've been there for about the last 10 years. So uh, what was the training and education that led to this position? Um, scattered. <laughs> so um, I, I, uh, I originally did my undergraduate degree in biological chemistry um, and then followed that up with a, a PhD in exercise physiology, actually. Um, and then uh, what I did from there was to do some postdoctoral training where I went to work on um, different aspects of the pharmaceutical chemistry that was involved. And that has sort of progressed off into doing more and more with pharmacology. Um, I would say that pharmacology is, is good for me, not necessarily because I specifically trained in it, but I trained at the either end of that, of doing the biology of chemistry and the physiology and pharmacology is the subject which kind of links the two together. But ultimately, I kind of just see myself as a basic biomedical scientist. That is a very intense training process. What was the inspiration behind this career choice that you're currently in? Um, so my, my main inspiration in that was actually my incredibly poor athletic performance. <laughs> so, um, I, I, I kind of always, you know, wanted to, 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 to do, uh, to play rugby and to run. And I was always interested in that. I was interested in training and, um, particularly when I was in my late teens, early twenties, I was interested in getting stronger and a little bigger. And I read a lot of things about how you could train and I read about, uh, how, what's called ischemia reperfusion, the restriction of blood flow and then the, the return of blood flow into tissues was one of the stimuli that made muscle grow. And I became very interested in that, how you could train with it. And then with that sort of biological chemistry part of it, I wanted to understand the processes that were involved. And so that's kind of why I got into the exercise physiology of looking at testing and exercise performance and how training could work. And then trying to understand those mechanisms. And that's translated onto me working in very different places um, in the lung, in the brain, in the muscle, um, working with babies with persistent pulmonary prevention of the newborn to um, adults with neurodegenerative disease and ALS. Um, so it's kind of a little bit diverse in the end. That's amazing. I know we're going to get a lot of questions in our comments about that. So uh, for anyone interested in asking any live questions, please just go ahead and comment them. Uh, I am seeing any of your comments or questions live, and all of our panelists can answer them in a live time. Uh, Dr. Gao is actually joined by two of his colleagues from Rutgers University, uh, so Dr. Grace Guo and Dr. Lori Joseph. Uh, so beginning with Dr. Joseph, can you begin by introducing yourself and your job title as well? My name is Lori Joseph. I am a research associate professor in the Department of Pharmacology and Toxicology at the Hermes Mario School of Pharmacy at Rutgers. Uh, my education background, uh, my research interests, I should first say, I study uh, the effects of environmental toxins on the skin. And my education is interesting. I started off as a geologist. I got my bachelor's degree in geology at George Washington University. I was a geological oceanographer for the Smithsonian for many years, and I became interested in the effects of asbestos and other particulates in the lung and in the body. So I went on for, finally, after when I went back to school, I traveled quite a bit around the world doing oceanography, and I decided to go back to school at Ohio State the Ohio State, I'm told, uh, and got a master's and then a PhD in experimental pathology. My master's in experimental pathology looked at the effects of environmental toxins, uh, particulates uh, on the uh, lung and uh, on cells that we know now are not the right cells. 
I looked at fibroblasts and that's why it's called mesothelioma and that could be another couple of days of explaining that. And we found out those weren't the right cells now. And then I did a PhD on uh, endothelial cells, which are the cells that line your arteries and veins because I was interested in wound repair during uh, diabetes and how cells and walk and talk to each other. So I looked at that. Uh, now, then I went on to work in industry for quite a few years. I did a postdoctoral fellowship at Yale first, and I did one at the University of Connecticut. I went to industry and uh, helped to develop uh, numerous technologies for uh, looking at how cells can be grown in culture. And then I eventually ended up at uh, a company that was raw material supplier to the personal care and cosmetics and uh, household industrial and, and uh, pharm pharmacy, which I'm still a member of to this day. And now here at Rutgers, I study the effects of, I said, toxins on the skin and how skin ages and how it repairs itself. I feel like you have such an incredible, diverse background uh, that there's so much to learn from you. Do you have an iteration behind uh, your reasoning for pursuing all this research or behind your current career choice in general? Well, my current career choice is I was invited by colleagues to come to Rutgers uh, after being in this street for quite a while. I took a, decided to take a new turn as I reached a certain age and found that uh, I enjoy watching students uh, learn and how they learn from each other and how I can try to help them move forward towards their goals. And now I'm lucky enough to be colleagues with uh, Dr. Gao and Dr. Guo and work with them on projects. Um, Dr. Guo and I work together on projects because the skin and the intestines are from the same area. So we work, I work on that with her and uh, have worked with Dr. Gao previously looking at lung function with uh, particulates. So I like watching students get the, you know, the eye, they get it. I like seeing that twinkle in their eye after sitting there for quite a while, slugging through all the stuff that we still do. And then it's like, oh, it means something. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's wonderful. So that's why I like doing this now. Uh, yeah, I absolutely agree with you. Seeing the accomplishments in students here at the Liberty Science Center honestly gives us that same smile and that same gratitude. Um, I actually just saw a comment from uh, Kaylana. She's Rutgers Proud and joining us from uh, our Facebook stream. So uh, going on to Dr. Guo, um, can you begin by introducing yourself and your job title and the education and training that led to your current position? All right. Um, yeah, it's very nice to uh, meet you here today. Uh, I'm uh, Dr. Grace Guo. Uh, I'm associate professor in the same department as Dr. Gao and Dr. Joseph, pharmacology and toxicology at the School of Pharmacy, uh, Rutgers University. Uh, so when I was a high school student, my dream is to become a physicist when I grown up. Uh, because I, I was very talented in physics and got the second award uh, at a national competition. Uh, but my dad had a heart attack when he was only 42, uh, second year in my high school. So that changed my whole perspective about career choice. Uh, so both me and my sister ended up going to, med uh, went to, went to medical school. And then uh, after graduating from medical school, I was working in the occupational uh, medicine hospital in China, uh, the only occupational medical um, hospital in China, in Chengdu, Sichuan, uh, where the uh, giant panda uh, is hosted. Um, so when I was a uh, resident there, a resident there for two years, I actually um, had several patients. Uh, this is in, this is from '93 to '95 in China. Uh, just opened up the market, has a lot of uh, economic reform, but the working condition for workers was horrible. So I have two young teenager girls. They all from a local farm uh, family. 
went to work in the local basketball or shoes company uh, where there's no proper occupational uh, regulation or ventilation. So they both uh, become uh, permanently paralyzed because of uh, organic uh, organic um, solvent intoxication. So that's totally changed my perspective again, uh, becoming a physician for my life, because I realized that no matter what I do, I can't treat my patients. So that pushed me to go uh, get a PhD in toxicology. So I went to University of Kansas Medical Center uh, study with Dr. Klassen, who is one of the best toxicologists in the world for metal toxicology. Um, but after I joined his group, um, he changed his mind of working in heavy metal and the toxicology, pursuing his dream when he was a PhD student, working on hepatic drug metabolism and transport. So my entire PhD uh, thesis dissertation was focusing on molecular regulation of the liver transporters. And then that made me to work with uh, Dr. Gonzalez, another top scientist in the world for drug metabolism at NIH. So after uh, getting my PhD, I went back to Kansas, worked for eight years as a faculty. And eight years ago, I proudly joined Rutgers and become the colleagues of uh, Dr. Gao and Dr. Joseph. And I have been really um, enjoyed uh, mentoring liberty science students in my lab. And so far I have three, four liberty science students in my lab for the last uh, several years. And then especially you probably heard about Jason, um, uh, Jason, uh, Jason Chen, uh, he worked two years in my lab as a liberty science summer intern. Actually, the second year, because he was so good, we requested, we requested him to be back for a second summer. And uh, he's now in Yale working uh, uh, in biomedical engineering. So that's my um, career inspiration and uh, connections with the Liberty Science Center. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. So uh, just to let everyone know, um, Dr. Grace Guo is talking about our partners in science program that we sponsor here at the Liberty Science Center. Uh, every summer, we partner a group of high school students with a mentor in their interests of science, and they spend the whole summer doing research in their lab and learning from these amazing mentors. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. Uh, so, Dr. Mei Kwonk, uh, could you also begin by introducing yourself, uh, your job title, and the education and training that led to your current position? Thank you, Carolyn, for the invitation to be a part of this esteemed panel. My title is I'm a Principal Scientific Account Lead. I'm with Janssen Pharmaceuticals, a part of Johnson & Johnson. My education leading up to my, my current career path is I did my undergraduate education. I knew I wanted to go into pharmacy school. So I did my basic science, math, prerequisites in order to get into pharmacy school. I graduated from the University of California, San Francisco School of Pharmacy. I actually had the opportunity to do a research fellowship with one of my professors, my renal transplant professor. And I spent the year working with patients, really being able to study how medications were metabolized and the pharmacokinetics of drugs in patients who had renal compromise. So patients who were on dialysis or who had some compromised renal function. So being able to work on early stage clinical trials, determining you know the dose that patients would be um, dosed with if a drug came to market. So before a drug ever comes to market, there's a lot of you know bench research as well as clinical research that goes into medications before they ever will be given to a patient. So I had the opportunity to do a, a pharmacokinetic research fellowship with one of my professors at University of California, San Francisco. After that, I decided I actually wanted to be in patient care, seeing patients, taking care of patients. 
So I pursued a primary care ambulatory care residency on the other side of the country at the Virginia Commonwealth University. And I did a one year residency, being able to work with patients, doctors, nurses, being able to look at patients who had chronic diseases like diabetes, hypertension, you know, patients who had atrial fibrillation. So we really managed their medications. Many of these patients were on anywhere from five to 10 medications. So the important aspect of being a pharmacist is we are medication experts. You know, a lot of what we do is making sure that the patients are getting the, the right medications, they're taking it appropriately, they're actually taking their medications. So a lot of education of the patients, and then we work very closely with other healthcare providers to, to manage their diseases. So I was able to stay on with the hospital as a ambulatory manager and had the opportunity to work in a number of different fields there, both in clinics where our pharmacists worked alongside other doctors and nurses, as well as our investigational drug pharmacy where companies like Johnson & Johnson and other pharmaceutical companies have to do research. Um, these investigational pharmacists manage all those drugs that are really regulated when you're doing clinical trials. I also had the opportunity to work in a nursing home as well as a home care facility. So a lot of the outpatient ambulatory services, I think as we think about you know, a pharmacist, you typically think of that drugstore pharmacist, but there are uh, many different roles that pharmacists play both outside of the hospital as well as inside of the hospital. After I left Virginia Commonwealth University, I had a unique opportunity to work for a National Pharmacy Association, the American Society of Health System Pharmacists. And with professional associations, we really help um, support other pharmacists in terms of elevating their practice, helping work with government agencies to address policies, to help advance the profession, as well as publications and other research that the association does. So really acting as a resource for the profession to help advance care and support other pharmacists in the profession. I made my way back to the West Coast and joined the pharmaceutical industry. I worked for um, a couple of different pharmaceutical companies as a medical science liaison, where I was a field-based medical scientist for the most part, helping to educate other healthcare providers about our medications as well as answer questions about our medications. And then about 15 years ago, I joined Johnson & Johnson and I've had the opportunity to be a field-based medical scientist. I've also had the opportunity to work in-house in our headquarters office, really looking at how clinical trials are done, um, once a drug's been approved, we still continue to do research after a drug's been done. So being able to be involved in those clinical trials as well, and working with other healthcare providers, again, making sure that the medications are taken appropriately. You know, it's much of what we do is making sure that uh, our medications are safe and used effectively in the right patient. And so it's important for us as educators to continue to educate other healthcare providers and be there as a scientific resource answering their questions. And in my current role as a scientific account lead, I'm based in actually Seattle, Washington. I um, work with our um, managed care companies as well as other hospital systems. Again, educating on our medications as well as answering their questions about our medication and helping to facilitate any research interests around our medications as well. Thank you so much. Uh, we actually have a colleague from Johnson Johnson joining us in the comments. So uh, Michael Bizdak says he's happy to be here from Johnson Johnson and that may learn by doing go VCU. So <laughs> It's great to have uh, some of our friends joining us in the comments. So jumping back to uh, Dr. Gao, um, what does a day in your career look like or a day in your research? Do you have a favorite part of it? Um, yeah, my, so um, this may sound a little odd, but my, my, my favorite part of the day is actually about 4.30 in the morning. Oh my goodness. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, 
I, I used to, so when I was in my sort of graduate time, I was doing a lot of, uh, doing a lot of sport. I was doing a lot of personal training work and many of my clients wanted to work early in the morning. So I'd work with people early in the morning and then I would go in to start doing uh, research work. Um, and, you know, I've sort of kind of kept that, that up. And so I usually find that I have a space of about an hour to two hours in the morning, very early um, when I'm awake. And I just kind of, I've got a, kind of got into the use, routine of just waking up early at that point. Um, and so I don't actually set an alarm. I just kind of wake up, come downstairs and I'll start reading and um, sometimes writing, but most of the time just reading. Um, and that's actually my favorite time because it's the time when I get to learn and I get to understand. And I think, you know, one of the keys and I think as we listen to the uh, journeys involved, you know, there's a lot of pieces as you go along, you develop more skills. Um, a lot of this is where can you learn from? And I find that reading is such an important thing to do. And however much time I've done reading, I haven't done enough. So uh, that's kind of my favorite time because it's undisturbed and you can get on with some of that reading work, which is really um pretty key but then you know then the sort of the regular day starts interactions with graduate students and as dr joseph and dr Guo were talking about you know enjoying the graduate students is great and then um teaching the pharmacy students and working in the pharmacy school when during normal term time um you know is also another sort of a, a, an interesting advent um i think uh growing up in the in the uk um where academics has very much always been a combination between research and teaching um, that was certainly something that I looked for. Um, when I was a, a postdoc and a junior faculty member, I was always at um, uh, private institutions like Penn and Duke and et cetera, where it was all about research and research only. And so students might come in, but it would always be part of the research program. One of the things I like about being at Rutgers, which I think is a, a little bit different when you're at a public university, is that you have a significant role in teaching as well as in research. And I actually find that translation, as well as the translation of basic science to clinical practice, is actually one of the more sort of fulfilling parts to it. The other part I would tell you about it, you know, a day in your career, what does it look like? Not like any other day in the career. So each one is different. They change a little bit. You're never quite sure what's going to come. And I like that. I'm not particularly good at steady, solid routines. So having a few things change around is, is kind of good for me. So that would be my sort of spin on it. I definitely agree that uh, in medicine, your day changes very varying by what's going on in uh, the field. You said you read a lot and you would recommend to anyone to read a lot. Do you have a book recommendation for maybe a high school or early college student? So what I would say, if you're interested in research, there's a tendency we always want to push to, to learn more facts, right? And so we want to go get you know, um, uh, reading about what facts are. Well, I think the important thing to remember there is there are no facts. People always hate that when you say that about science, but there are actually no facts. There is a book called The Half-Life of Facts, which is a very interesting book if you want to try reading it, because what we essentially do with research is we work on disproving what's previously been known. Every theory is just that. It's a model to move you forward, to help you ask the right questions, to do the right experiments. But eventually that's going to change and it's going to move over. So understanding how to think about things and how to use what we know today to answer problems is more important. So things that I would, would focus on are more things about scientific, I'm not saying it's scientific theories that get taught in school, but thinking about thought, thinking about the way that you can use your, your mind to answer questions. So I say there's this one book called The Half-Life of Facts, which is very interesting, probably the most interesting and small read that you can do is a book called what is life it was written by Erwin schrodinger in 1943 um he was as we, you know, we know he was a quantum mechanicist but uh, he kind of got bored of quantum mechanics and he wanted to explain biology and uh, so he gave a series of lectures in dublin about how it was difficult to predict what was going on because we didn't know all of the all the variables or have the computing power to answer the questions um, and it's a very interesting book from a thought process. Um, and um, I think that I guess that would probably be a pretty good recommendation. Anything on that line of how do we think about things is a, kind of a good way to sort of follow that. Thank you so much. Uh, my next question later on uh, will be about any papers or any work that you've published. But uh, moving on to Dr. Joseph, can you walk us through a day in your career or a day in your life? 
You're muted, Laurie. Oh, you're muted. Muted. Oh, you're still muted. I just clicked it. Okay. Is it open now? Yes, there you go. <laughs> well, I don't get up at 4.30 in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe I did at one point when I rode when I was in college, but that's uh, close to a half century ago now. Uh, but nowadays, what I do is I come to work. I go into my laboratory, my first thing, I turn on my computer because I know I'll be stuck at it most of the day. And I'd rather go into the lab and sit quietly and look through the microscope at slides. Now, I get quiet for a bit of time, depending on the time of the year. Uh, sometimes I'm assisting uh, Dr. Gao in teaching this last semester. Sometimes I'm giving seminars to other places in the world. Uh, I also enjoy reading and it's a luxury to be able to sit there and open up PubMed and just scan through all the areas that I might have an interest. Now I tell the students, just start typing at the top areas that you're interested in. And there might not be papers in that exactly or what you're studying, but it'll open your mind to different things. Uh, as I said, I like sitting at the scope. I know that sounds really crazy, but it allows me to see what is going on at a cellular level. And I enjoy that. I also enjoy it when I have a preponderance of uh, pharmacy students. And I mean a preponderance. It's sometimes I feel like I have to have a, what is it, a delicatessen, take a number mm -hmm. and stand in line. <laughs> Uh, walking by Dr. Gao's office, you sometimes sit, look for the line because he has students wrapped around the outside. But I enjoy it. They come in. Uh, we talk about other things besides school. We talk about what do you really want to be? What do you want to do? And I find that's one of the reasons I went back uh, into teaching at this stage. Uh, I hadn't done it in a very, very long time, and it took me a while to get used to it coming from industry. Uh, it's very different. But uh, let's see, I work on grants, I write papers, uh, interact with other colleagues and their colleagues from their laboratories to try to assist them in figuring out new ways to look at things. So that's part of my day and trying to uh, close my door and keep some people out. <laughs> Thank you so much. For... But for kids, for students, I've had a lot of Liberty Science students in my mm -hmm. laboratory. Uh, two of them are in uh, MD, uh, BSMD programs once now. I had she was in my laboratory for two summers. Thank you, Dr. Guo, for reminding me. Uh, she's now in her first year of medical school at Rensselaer. Uh, and another young man is in the BSMD program at Drexel. I'm, and other students that have gone on to other things, so I'm very proud of them. Uh, what was your other question? I'm sorry. Uh, so you answered most of it about uh, what does a day in your career look like and thank you so much for giving our partners in science a shout out. We absolutely love to hear back from our mentors about the amazing work these students are doing in their laboratory. Um, if you'd like to share a book recommendation, maybe movie, documentary well, that... Um... Well, worse than that, I'm from the, since I was a geologist, my attitude mm -hmm. is get outside and dig around. Uh, Students ask me, well, or parents say to me, well, what should I do? I said, let them enjoy the outdoors. Let them, if they like to, if they like chemistry, put them in the kitchen. Let them see chemistry at work. Watch them fry an egg and then try to figure out what happens to it. Uh, my granddaughters, I got them a book on kitchen chemistry, which I bought at the Liberty Science Center. Oh. <laughs> and the first thing I did was through... Uh, white vinegar into grape juice and it turned clear and the so my feeling is this the smallest thing is science and watching things like that happen are wonderful so that's my feeling thank you so much for sharing that with us uh dr guo can you walk us through a day in your career or a day in your life uh yes um so i'm not a very good at multitasking. So normally I put my time into different blocks. Uh, I would say uh, three scenarios, like a typical day. 
So if I have a manuscript or grant to write, I normally lock myself up in the office for holding, not receiving any phone calls or uh, occasionally check emails, just write for the whole day. And then uh, some days I work with the students in my lab, particularly graduate students or postdocs, just to go over their research data. And that's a very typical day in the work. And then the third is, um, uh, uh, I do a lot of public service, especially for uh, NIH or other journal reviewers. Uh, so I would say a big chunk of my time is actually reading other scientists' scientific proposals, giving feedback, and also reading uh, submitted manuscripts, especially in um, FXR, bioassays, fatty liver field, and give feedbacks. Um, so that's uh, typically my day of uh, my, my three kinds of typical working days. And then when I was younger, I read a lot of different novels. Uh, but now as a, a mom of these two kids, uh, a big lab, and also uh, we just adopted a young puppy, I, I don't really have time to read a lot of novels. Uh, so I just try to focus the time, read a lot of scientific papers or um, sub, uh, submissions. And then the other thing uh, for me, my favorite time is actually after 10 p.m. in contrast to Dr. Gao. Uh, that's my quiet time. After the kids go to sleep, uh, the puppies in the cage, the night basically just try to finish whatever I haven't finished for the day or working on uh, reviewing grants or manuscripts. And then I, I I, the other thing I really enjoyed is, uh, I know it's probably a lot of um, girls in the Liberty Science program, and then just try to find a work and a life balance. Like no matter how busy I am, I always, if I'm at home, I always try try to cook kids the best breakfast and the dinner possible, and then have meal with them, talk to them, to see how their day has been. Uh, because as a scientist, you can make yourself working 24 hours and still not be able to finish the things that you plan to do. And then if you have children or family, they are only going to be with you for basically up to 20 years before they get out of the house. So I really enjoyed be, uh, being a mom and then spend the time with my children and family. Um, that's my typical days. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Uh, do you have a book recommendation, movie, uh, documentary that you'd like to share with any of our uh, students watching? Um, well, for people, students in my lab, just like Dr. Joseph has recommended, uh, I ask them to log into uh, PubMed every week, just use the keywords that are focused in our lab and then look for new publications uh, personally, I, my reading, I don't have a focused reading. I read everything, um, novels, magazines, um, hobby books. I, so I like um, antique collections. So I read a lot of Chris May collection books, um, whatever. Like for movies, um, when I was younger, I liked drama and really sus uh, like suspension movies. But after I was having kids, I found out I can only watch uh, comedies and not any other movies. Like any movie with a sad ending make me feel not comfortable. Um, yeah, I, and the other thing I really like, I, I enjoy uh, hiking and sports. So um, we play a lot of badminton. Uh, we go out to national parks or museums whenever we could. I think uh, you have to find a life and the uh, work balance so that going to going back to work actually is become a really eager and urgent thing uh, to basically get away from the from the kids from the house rather than force yourself to to work. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. Just my um, um, my two cents. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Uh, Dr. Kwong, could you also walk us through a day in your life and your career? 
Yes. I typically start my morning off scanning the news, both, you know, regular news as well as healthcare news, um, understanding what's happening in healthcare from a landscape perspective, as well as other, you know, science research, research that we're doing, um, understanding what's happening within Johnson and Johnson as well as other companies. So that's how I typically start my day, just to have that foundation as to what's happening from a overall healthcare landscape. A typical day also includes sitting through a training or otherwise known as a, a lecture in, in most senses on our medications, um, whether it's one or two training calls that we're on. And then also talking to our customers, talking to other pharmacists and being able to um, present uh, our information to pharmacists and helping address those questions um, you know, typically my day ends with reading more science journals that these esteemed professors have written as well as other professors. Again, just being able to have that um, knowledge, the continual knowledge um, zest for, for reading and learning um, that does not end as a pharmacist. And especially in my current job, being responsible for many medications, we are you know, constantly learning both about our medications as well as other medications, things that are being developed um, with our company as well as other companies. So trying to stay on in on top of all the information that is out there from a science perspective for many different diseases. So, you know, not only understanding the science of the medication, but also understanding about the disease itself, because if you don't exactly understand what's happening in the body with the disease, it's hard to really understand what that medication is gonna do for that disease. So it's both the, the basic science of understanding what's happening with the patient and their body and their disease and the physiology behind that, but also understanding how the medications work both from, you know, early stage research to also, you know, how medications are, are utilized and how effective or how safe they are. So lots of scientific journal reading, um, like Dr. Guao, you know, I'm a mother of two and so, times to actually sit down and read a novel are, are pretty limited these days, especially with trying to stay on top of all the scientific journal publications that are out there. Thank you so much uh, to all of you for sharing a day in your life and giving us a real perspective on what it really is to do what you do. Um, Dr. Kwong, just to finish off, do you have any recommendations to any of our students, a book, a documentary series, movie that you'd like to recommend to our students watching? Um, I would say there's actually a Netflix um, documentary right now called The Pharmacist um, that is out there. Uh, that is a very interesting take on um, the state of healthcare that we're in right now. Um, the other recommendation I would have for anybody who's interested in pursuing a career in pharmacy, there's a, a, a good resource called Pharmacy is Right for Me um, for those uh, younger folks that are out there interested in what it takes to get into pharmacy school. It has a lot of resources for um, information is the types of classes you want to focus on, you know, the, the types of um, characteristics that are important. I think the other, you know, just general important thing is there are so many areas that pharmacists practice. I mean, from the, the teachers that are, the faculty members that are in front of us to um, myself working within the pharmaceutical industry. So it's not just that pharmacist that you see in the drugstore. Um, there's lots of different opportunities that are out there. Thank you. For and Ooh. Carolyn, you, yes. you talked about Virginia Commonwealth University. There is one fun fact. The current Miss America is a pharmacy student at Virginia Commonwealth University. And because we're talking about STEM, she actually won um, her, she actually did a science experiment as part of her, um, as part of her program. Oh, so. th that's amazing. <laughs> I definitely have to check that out. Again, thank you all so much for sharing all of this with us. Um, and thank you for sharing some advice for any of our students watching. 
Uh, just to close off for any of our panelists, is there any advice you would want to give any of our students watching or anyone interested in pursuing a career in medicine? So, um, not so much, I, well, I don't know why I say it's career in medicine, but career in biomedical sciences, at least. Um, what I would say is, um, and this sounds a little bit weird uh, in some extent with everyone having talked about the, uh, how they enjoy the interaction and everything, um, you mostly need to be driven by your passion for the question. Um, uh, and unfortunately, and it's sort of, I don't want to say this true, but you know, actual practice of doing science, as Dr. Joseph talked about looking down the microscope, is a little bit tedious. You have to repeat experiments, you have to be sure about data, you have to look for error levels, you have to be very precise, you have to be very careful. Um, when you do all of that, if you're not truly interested in the answer, if you're just doing it because you think it's for the good of mankind or person kind, then that probably isn't going to work out so well for you, because eventually it'll become too boring. But if you really want to know the answer to the question, if the if the problem itself just totally fascinates you, then it's so much reward when you can finally get some piece of information out at the end. Um, I do sometimes joke with my students that one of my main things is that I don't really like sick people very much, but I love disease. And I don't mean that I love what happens to people with disease, but disease is very interesting. Understanding the processes that are involved so that you can think about medications appropriate, what's the right way to go, or even how do you avoid them? How do you prevent diseases? You know, that becomes very interesting. But there, it's the questions that drive you. So what I would say is if you're thinking about a career in research, any field of research, make sure it's a field that it, it's a question that you really want to, you want to know the answer to. That would be my piece of advice. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Joseph or Dr. Guo, would you like to share a piece of advice for any of our students watching or any of our uh, guests watching today? What I tell the students, and this is how I do it, you got to feel it in your gut. You've got to really, really want it. And, you know, the thing is, you don't have to be an A student. They always say, oh, the A student. Well, to be honest with you, I wasn't an A student in college. But as I laugh and I say, they call me doctor now because I found a passion. I found an interest. I wanted to understand. And that's what drove me. And it can drive anybody. You've got to understand, as Aunt Dr. Uh, Gao said and Dr. Guo reiterated, that you've got to take small steps to get where you are. But you have to be able to enjoy what you're doing. Because if you find it to be a drudge, don't do it. And I tell any student or any colleague that's doing this, if you don't enjoy doing it, find something else. There are a lot of other things you can do in this world. Life, you live a long life. And if you're started in your high school and say, I'm going to be a surgeon, and by the time you reach 30, you hate it, you've got to rethink and be able to change and shift your alternatives. And that's one thing that I've done all my life is build on. And as Dr. Guo has said, she's built on and changed and modified. And same as Dr. Gao. I've always been interested in how the, uh, the earth bangs together. Now that sounds strange, but planets, the planet does that. And that's why we have earthquakes. But what are the materials that are released and how do they affect your skin, which is an area I'm working in right now with companies or how do different things happen? So you just have to have, you know, a love, or as um, they said in the, uh, the story of Van Gogh, you have to have a lust for life. And I have a lust for science. I, it's a deep down interest in it. And I hope all the students and everybody who's listening are lucky enough to have this as they go through life, a lust and an interest in it. Thank you, enjoy this, this is lovely. Thank Great you. job, Carolyn. Thank you all so much. Uh, thank you for those amazing words of advice to our students. We really hope here at the Liberty Science Center and all of our panelists who joined us today that you were inspired by the stories that we shared. We also have our panel from last week if you're interested in checking that out. Again, thank you all so much for joining me to continue to do programs like this every week. Um, we do that by your donations through our LSE Sustainability Fund. So if you're able to do um, 
any donations or provide any information for us, you can find our sustainability fund on our website or our Facebook page. Again, thank you so much to all of our panelists for joining us. And I'm seeing a lot of thank yous in the comments as well. So uh, thank you for joining us this week and we hope to see you next week with Mr. Alejandro for another live stream. Bye everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.